Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good late night, depending on where you are in the world. Today, we're going to talk about a couple of things. One is a breakthrough, a potential breakthrough um, in aging. Now, that's coming from David Sinclair, and I've done a few videos on him. As you know, he, he self-acknowledges that he can be quote, a little bit cheeky, end quote. In other words, a little bit like a used car salesman. Uh, but he's got good science. And this is a very interesting topic that we'll be talking about a little today. That's just going to be one of the short uh, preliminary topics. The bigger topic is aspirin for secondary cardiovascular prevention. If I've had one point of confusion about that with, or, or seen one of point of confusion about that. I've seen hundreds, you know. What happened was <clears throat> there used to be a lot of uh, standards saying if you're age 50, age-based primary prevention for baby aspirin. And they typically said, if you're 55 or older, you need to take baby aspirin. If you're 60 or older, you need to take baby aspirin. And they stopped that. Um, my own uh, group, the uh, College of Preventive Medicine, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, all backed off on that. Well, when they did, that made a lot of the lay press. And unfortunately, the lay press doesn't understand the difference between primary and secondary prevention. So you saw a big decrease in people using baby aspirin. Well, you know what? If you don't have any plaque, you don't have any cardiovascular disease, then you don't need baby aspirin. But if you have plaque or any other version of cardiovascular disease, you need some, some type of uh, blood thinner. Baby aspirin is the most common type. If you have atrial fib, you need a stronger one. Uh, the, uh, the NOAX, novel oral anticoagulants are better uh, if you have atrial fib. But we've had a lot of questions over the past few weeks about things like, well, wait a minute, what about the enteric coated aspirin? I can't find that. That doesn't does that work or not? So we're going to cover several items specific to aspirin for secondary prevention, and it'll be several different articles. So we've got a lot to cover today. Let's go ahead and get started. Recent uh, topics, becoming part of the healthiest top 10%. Here's the bottom line on that one. We're getting more and more and more unhealthy as a country and as a world. Uh, that's just frustrating. When you do what I do for a living and your career's all about helping people avoid heart attack, stroke, and death, disability, blindness, kidney disease, it's frustrating to see that we're not getting better, we're getting worse. In the second uh, topic, Lifestyle Changes for New Year's Resolutions, basically it talked about do these things actually work? And when they work, some of them do, how to make them work better. The third one has to do with a major uh, transition, a major project we have going on. Over the past two years, um, in addition to my practice uh, with uh, self-pay patients and across the country, uh, and, well, actually across the world, in addition to the YouTube channel, uh, we also started up and ran a, um, a fee-for-value program, a Medicare Advantage program for the citizens of Alabama. It was very well received, grew very quickly, and in fact, grew far quicker than we expected to, an, to a point where I personally could not financially support it. It needed to, to, we needed to hook up with a much larger company. And that we did this past June. I'm still a, uh, a major participant. Um, 
with that company. Um, but here's one of the things that we found out, and that is, why do it for just Alabama? Why don't we look at providing uh, fee for value across the country, Medicare advantages across the country, and straight Medicare is across the country? So we've been working over the past few months to get the, our practice set up for Medicare. We recently got a provisional agreement uh, for met, uh, straight or traditional Medicare. Um, we're not quite ready to start bringing on patients. We will be looking at a couple of pilot patients over the next few weeks. So yes, we're making a lot of progress and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later today, especially if there are questions. We've got a couple of introductory slides on it too. Now, for those that haven't uh, been involved with our channel before, here's the thing. Here's what we're all about. Helping people avoid the major cause of death and disability. Because unfortunately, the science is, and using science uh, to back up what we say, and unfortunately, the science, the scientific evidence is pretty clear. Um, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes is a far bigger cause of heart attack and stroke than our medical systems understand. In fact, between a half and two thirds of prediabetes and a, a half of diabetes, maybe two thirds, is totally unrecognized. If you look at the CDC site, they'll say a third, but they're just looking at A1C. If you actually look at something like uh, OGTT or even more so, an insulin survey, you begin to realize that we are way, way off base. It's like the majority of these diseases are not recognized. More recent information from JAMA Network and uh, UCLA have indicated that it's not a third of people with uh, age 65 or older. It's one half of people 30 and older. So why don't you go to your doctor? Well, here's the problem with that. It's also very clear that two thirds of doctors don't know how to diagnose prediabetes, let alone manage it. So Again, our core courses uh, are right here. They're available. We suggest and would appreciate a donation for it. But if you can't afford a donation, then get it for free. It's how to assess plaque, cardiovascular plaque, insulin resistance. What is it? We go deep into the actual scientific details, but we also make it very clear how to diagnose it for yourself and what to do about it. The connection between insulin resistance, prediabetes, and plaque is cardiovascular inflammation. Most people don't understand that, including doctors. Cardiovascular inflammation is basically just where your body is taking friendly fire. Your own immune system is causing damage. You know, that was the thing that uh, back during the pandemic days, when people were dying from the from, uh, from COVID, uh, it was because of a uh, cytokine storm. In other words, again, our own immune system uh, overreacting to damage and damaging our body. That is incredibly common. It happens all the time with multiple diseases, not just cardiovascular disease and, and um, COVID, just dozens and dozens of other diseases. So you have to understand inflammation much better than our medical, our medical folks, our medical industrial complex un, uh, understands. And if you have a question about me using the term medical industrial complex, ask a question about it later during the Q&A. If you're not a, uh, if you want to help us get this information out, we, we are all over the world in, in terms of our channel. Um, and in fact, for example, the people of China uh, are the number five country in terms of downloading our, uh, our blogs, our, um, our content. 
So it's all over the world. In fact, we moved our uh, YouTube live time period to help uh, help make it easier for people in Asia to pick up this information. Now, uh, if you if you're a YouTuber, if you'll join the channel, that makes a big difference. Uh, basically, what it does is it helps us get the information out that people need um, to protect their health. If you're not a YouTube kind of person, you're more into Locals and Rumble, we have that content as well. And in fact, there's some content on Locals that you won't find anywhere else. Uh, we'll talk about subscription plans later, uh, not today uh, on our uh, today's show. We'll also not talk about the Prevention Myths book, What a Stress Test Can't Tell You. Um, not going to talk very deeply about that. What we do want to do, though, is mention our New Physicians Prevention Network. One of, one of the things that many people react to is, hey, doc, um, you can't see everybody. And I'd like to see somebody that I can go to his or her office. But my doctor knows nothing about this. Um, can you help? Well, just like we train the doctors uh, in Alabama, we're developing a system where we can train doctors all over the country um, to do prevention. And prevention, by the way, is not just good for the patient. It's good for the doctor and it's good for the payers, for the insurers, the people that have to pay for our illness. How did it become good for doctors? That's a long story. And again, that's one of the things that we're starting, we're gearing up to help doctors understand and teach doctors how to make this work for them. Uh, we, we have two new, um, we have a new YouTube channel, the Doctors Prevention Network, and a new website, physiciansnetwork.prevmedhealth.com. So let's get to one of the shorts. I mentioned something coming from um, David Sinclair earlier. This article was featured in Time Magazine. It came out, it was published in Cell Magazine, the science magazine on January 12th. Scientists have reached a key milestone in learning how to reverse aging. You remember one of Sinclair's most recent things was he actually reversed blindness in a, a, a lab rat. Um, doing something very, very similar to what he's talking about here. So this is just the next step in terms of Sinclair's um, epigenetic and genetic uh, activities on reversing aging. So he wrote the book Lifespan, um, and we'll talk about that book Lifespan in a few minutes. I loved it. I did a series of about nine videos on it, and we'll talk about some of that as well to get deeper into some of the details. He did something interesting with the Yamanaka genes. Yamanaka is a researcher who won the Nobel Prize recently for discovering three genes which control the speed of cellular aging. He sped up and slowed down, uh, Sinclair sped up and slowed down the aging of mice using Yamanaka gene stimulation. Now, how did he stimulate or turn on and off a gene? Well, he tagged these genes with an antibiotic called doxycycline. Adding the doxycycline caused reversal of aging for the mice. Removal of the doxycycline caused the aging to restart. He's now doing this with human cells in vitro. Now, what does in vitro mean? It's not inside the person. That would be in vivo. So again, doing some very interesting work with actual human cells. Now, he says the first application of this might be human aging diseases of the eye. Why? Because you can inject into the eye itself. Ah, it sounds painful, doesn't it? But uh, there's an opportunity there. Now, <clears throat> this is really involving more epigenetics than pure genetics. And for those of you who are saying, wait a minute, that's getting a little bit 
technical. I did a whole series of videos on epigenetics versus genetics as well. Uh, we'll have a link for you down at the, the bottom. Epigenetics, if you go back to the, to the old fashioned library uh, that had nothing, uh, nothing online, it was all books in the library. And you had a thing, I think it was called the Dewey Decimal System. It was a way to find a book. That's what epigenetics are. You may hear the scientific term, the methylome. Why? Methylation is the major use, the major technique of the, quote, librarians of our genetic system. And there's some groups. I did, again, a couple of videos on how to look at the methylome and looking at groups that are really going deep in terms of helping us understand the methylome. Or in other words, how our body goes in and finds the gene that, it's need, that it needs for a certain activity. Now that may sound a little bit esoteric. You don't need that. Let me remind you of something that we all need and use on a regular basis. It has to do with fat adaptation. So if you, you know, if you start doing significant, if you decrease carbs, if you start doing uh, significant fasting, both of those uh, help you start relying metabolically for energy on fat. Well, if, we're in, if your body is in a mode of having eaten carbs three or four times a day or more often, it's never going to get to burning fat. So the enzymes, the proteins that are involved in burning fat just don't get used. So if you get to, you, you start going on a keto diet, you know, you've heard the term keto flu. What's going on there? Well, your body's not used to burning fat because it's been burning carbs. So you go through a, a phase to where mm, your body's not doing so well at uh, burning the fat that you're giving it for fuel. How does the body deal with that? Well, it goes back and it says, look, we need the proteins involved in burning fat. So then what happens? So then in the cells, the cells start going back and saying, okay, we've been using uh, carb burning enzymes, we now need to switch over to fat burning enzymes. And then the librarian, the epigenetics, the methylome kicks into gear, finding the proteins, the uh, enzymes that are involved in fat burning, looking those up and starting to stimulate those. So now you start beginning to understand this is a process they find after your uh, librarians, your genetic librarians, your methylome, your ge uh, genome finds the right genes and locates them, then it's got to start forming proteins. So you start having a good combination, uh, a, a, an access to a good combination of the enzymes needed to burn fat. So again, this is a multi-step process and as you begin to see, it's actually pretty neat that keto flu tends to only last a few days. You get some early start on that. One thing that you'll see, though, it helps you understand how it does take weeks to get fully fat adapted. So a little bit of a side, uh, a side note on epigenetics and why they're so important. Even if you think, man, that sounds esoteric, it's not. It's very practical. People are using it all day, every day. David Sinclair wrote a very interesting book. It was called Lifespan. I did a series on the book. The series includes videos on all the major components. Uh, there were nine videos, uh, the mechanisms of aging, uh, epigenetics in and of itself. I've got like I said, there's several videos on that. The information theory of aging. That's uh, something that David Sinclair came up with. And his point was, uh, genetically, we've got that library, but 
he used a little bit of a different analogy. His analogy was, well, wait a minute. Uh, that information is sort of like information uh, stored on an old record, a vinyl record. And then you start getting scratches as we start uh, getting some errors in, the, uh, in our genetic code. Then you get more and more errors and it's sort of like um, a ball of yarn or a, or a plastic bag of yarn that a cat has started playing with. You get these, you get these uh, cell nuclei and you get pieces of the, um, the genetic material, the DNA, get messed up, destroyed. And um, in the beginning, one or two problems are not that much of an issue, but as you get more and more uh, challenges there, you get more and more problems with aging. Now, <clears throat> that is something different. Um, the biggest uh, theory and mechanism behind aging, cellular aging, has been the one of mitochondrial decline. You hear several people talk about that. That was actually started in the 60s. Then you hear people talk about diabetes. So now, wait a minute, which of these is the real issue? The bottom line is it's all. All of these are major components of how our body ages. So, you know, uh, David uh, Sinclair, for example, has said from the beginning of his career, I want to develop the anti-aging pill. Personally, as uh, I don't think David's ever going to develop one pill. I don't think anybody's ever going to develop one pill that's going to stop aging. There are too many mechanisms, the mitochondrial mechanism, the, uh, some of the epigenetic problems, some of the um, uh, telomere length issues, uh, the information uh, loss, diabetes in and of itself, one of the major killers, whether it's causing aging or not, it's a major killer. So again, you've got way too many different uh, mechanisms of aging to have one pill just cause all of this or one pill that's going to fix it. Uh, <clears throat> so he also covered in the book the, the work of Walter, Walter Longo and others. And Longo, again, is very deep into diabetes and prediabetes and its impact on aging. He talks about something like zombie cells. Zombie cells are cells that have aged into uh, senescence, senility. And they're sort of like a grumpy old senile cell. They won't die. And here's the problem with that. They, they sort of infect other cells around them. So you remember we've talked many, many times about autophagy. One of one of the most important things that can happen with autophagy is its impact on zombie cells. Now, one of the problems is that even autophagy doesn't completely uh, impact all zombie cells. So it gets deeper and deeper and more and more complex. So uh, one of the other things that he talks about when he talks about diabetes, for example, is the fact that diabetes has a, and prediabetes have a special role not just in the human species, but in many species, multiple species, uh, ranging from some types of worms to insects to uh, all the way up to humans. So um, there's a lot of different, we take, we make use of that fact to use a lot of different laboratory species for uh, research in diabetes and prediabetes. So there you go. That's uh, David Sinclair's new work on anti-aging using the Yamanaka genes. Next, we're going to talk about aspirin for secondary prevention. aspirin for secondary prevention. So <clears throat> the first article we're going to talk about was in The Lancet in 2009. 
it talks about primary prevention, treating patients without disease, and secondary prevention, treating patients with established cardiovascular disease. And as you'll find, that key is the key to most of the disruption and um, errors that are going on today. People have seen these articles in Time Magazine, the New York Times, you name it. Uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force no longer requires uh, or recommends baby aspirin for uh, cardiovascular disease prevention. And people read that, they see the headline, they quit taking it. They still don't cover the, the difference between primary and secondary. Now, this was a meta-analysis in The Lancet. It included 16 trials. Aspirin showed a significant reduction. Now, if you read that, it sounds kind of, it sounds like the numbers internally don't work. Reduction of 8.2% of events when used for secondary strokes, one-fifth of strokes and heart attacks. The bottom line is you've got a denominator problem, which I won't go into. One thing I will do is give you the p-value. Do you remember what p-values are? I'm going to assume that you don't. It's a probability value. A probability that these results would have occurred in a random fashion. And you can do that using biased statistics, which we won't get into that, but I will give you the p-value. It was 0.0001. Unless I'm mistaken. And unless I'm mistaken, that's one in 10,000 probability that these results would have happened at random. In other words, baby aspirin showed a very, very strong uh, impact in these studies in terms of decreasing cardiovascular events, heart attacks and strokes. Now, the results of three other uh, major randomized clinical trials showed little to no benefit in aspirin with primary prevention. So again, it works great for secondary prevention, doesn't work very well for primary. In other words, if it's just your age and you have no plaque, no cardiovascular disease, you shouldn't be taking it. So there was a slight decrease in aspirin use. Uh, if you look at the trends, this was in the American Journal of Preventive Cardiology in 2021 in the US. There was a slight decrease in aspirin use. The, there was an increase of use in primary prevention without additional benefit. Aspirin is used for secondary prevention in about 70% of the cases. So in other words, about a third of us that need uh, baby aspirin for um, secondary disease prevent, cardiovascular disease prevention are just not taking it. There's uh, inconsistent use for secondary prevention in women. It's inexpensive and is easy to access. We'll talk about access in a minute. Bart Robinson mentioned uh, in one of our recent videos, uh, Doc, you just can't find baby aspirin without the, um, the enteric coating. And I went back and looked uh, because I have a, I'm an uh, atrial fib patient, uh, silent atrial fib or paroxysmal atrial fib. Uh, haven't had an, uh, an episode that I can feel in what, five years now, but I still take a NOAC, Rivaroxaban or Xarelto, which is what you should take because aspirin does not is not the correct blood thinner. It doesn't decrease the increased risk of uh, stroke for people with atrial fib. So I haven't, uh, again, I went down a long, made that a short bunny hole, a long one, but I made that bunny hole because uh, I wanted to make the point, I have not shopped for baby aspirin in quite a few years. Once, I, once Bart uh, on the channel, raised that issue, I started looking and I couldn't find enteric coated. I mean, I could not find non-enteric coated baby aspirin either. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, aspirin in primary prevention might decrease your calcium score. However, risk factors should be the major focus. The, uh, this was in circulation 2014. Um, 
the authors considered other risk factors, you know, for them, LDL, which is not a significant risk fac factor for, in my mind, uh, nearly as much as some of the other things like A1C, exercise, diet, smoking, blood pressure. Um, so aspirin use should be personalized. Now, what's the best dose? 81 milligrams or baby aspirin versus 325 milligrams. This goes back to the New England Journal 2021. There's no differences in cardiovascular outcomes between the doses. There were no significant differences on bleeding rates and most people took 81 milligrams. The lower dose is probably the better recommendation. A lot of that's built on the assumption that there's a thing called COX-2 inhibition, um, which I won't get into. So those of you who are my patients who take, uh, I, I have a few patients that take regular aspirin. And my recommendation is go back to the 81. Uh, but as you can see, it's, uh, it's not a big issue. Now, back to these comments about enteric-coated versus non-enteric-coated. The enteric-coated doesn't provide the expected protection. You go back, this is an article from the internal, uh, the International Journal of uh, General Medicine and the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, Jack, uh, the first in 2021 and the second in 2017. Enteric coats, as I've mentioned multiple times before, they don't provide the protection that you think they're going to provide. It does, however, decrease bioavailability, affecting the absorption. So why is all baby aspirin available with enteric coating? Because people assume that's the way to do it. Unfortunately, um, the marketing uh, decisions are not made by medical scientists and uh, they're not made for medical scientists. They're made for people, most of whom don't understand this. The coding is appropriate for patients with severe uh, GI symptoms and problems. Now, what do you do? Take chewable aspirin. It provides the most reliable antiplatelet effect. So there you go, Bart. Thank you again for uh, sharing that concern. Now, here's another issue. Is it better to take aspirin at night? Um, well, this was an article in Hypertension Magazine in 2015 from the Netherlands. Aspirin at bedtime did not reduce blood pressure compared with intake on awakening. Platelet reactivity during morning hours was reduced reduced with the bedtime intake. Bottom line is they really didn't answer that question. And here's my suspicion. I don't think they will. Some people need to take it in the morning because they, they do better taking it with food. And even if it's the chewable kind, and from my perspective, that's fine. You are really gonna, I, I suspect that the science, at this point, the science is, the evidence is inconclusive on time of day, and I suspect it will remain that way. So there you go, aspirin and cardiovascular prevention. If you'll give us the uh, intro to the Q&A, we'll go to that. So there you go. Let's go back and see what we've got in terms of questions. Okay, I see Bart Robinson. Huge thank you, Doc, for in addressing, I think what he was going to say is my, uh, let's see, addressing my aspirin question. Much appreciated. Well, you're very, very welcome, Bart, and I appreciate you bringing up the issue. Like I said, I haven't been shopping for baby aspirin, so I had no clue that it was hard to reach. Uh, LPG 12338 uh, comes in with a super chat. Um, 
Gilbert's showing you how you how you can do a super chat if you'd like to do that. Uh, LPG says, interesting topic, Doc. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, LPG. I appreciate that. He's a, a frequent contributor uh, to the show and helping people get access to this life-saving information. Now, <clears throat> um, this was early before we started the show. We have a new member, a uh, YouTube member, Arabella Horwitz. Um, thank you so much, Arabella. Becoming a member like that, again, helps us uh, defray costs, afford high quality um, graphics designers and uh, co-hosts like Gilbert, who's helping us today. Thank you so much, Arabella, and thank you, Gilbert. JMC2921, with respect to lowering LDLC, LDL cholesterol, is it true that PCSK9 inhibitors have absolutely no beneficial effect on all-cause mortality or even cardiovascular mortality? Uh, and the last time I looked, that was true. Now, <clears throat> uh, be careful before you jump to a lot of conclusions. Um, I, I, well, I, I will personally say, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't. I, I've jumped to the same conclusion myself. I think that's one of, one of the reasons for that is that LDL is maybe not quite the risk factor that everybody continues to, that most people continue to assume. Now, there's some other extenuating circumstances, though, to be aware of. Number one is there's, uh, PCSK9s are still, for those of you who don't know, that's um, the, the new super genetic uh, or super drugs that really lower cholesterol, LDL, more than any drug that we've had in the past. Um, they're still significantly expensive. Um, a lot of folks thought we were just going to uh, do away with heart attack and stroke once we uh, once we had that drug available. The discovery on that drug, I got to go down a brief money hole on that. The discovery on that drug was the opposite of what we've always done in the past. What we've always done in the past is we would find a new chemical somewhere in the world, out in the Amazon or with rapamycin, for example, on the island of Rapa Nui. Uh, the drug companies, when a new uh, organic chemical like that was found, would catalog them and then use them later to see what sort of impact, if any, they had on biological and therefore medicine um, activities. They did it differently uh, for PCSK9s. In, with PCSK9s, they started doing uh, surveys of people, and they found a few people, one specifically a teenager in Texas, a cheerleader, who had very low LDL. And they started looking at her genetics and ended up going back to copy her genetics. So they did it the opposite way of how we've done uh, drug discovery in the past. So that's actually become a big deal uh, since then. Anyhow, bottom line, have they wiped out heart attack and stroke? No, they haven't. Um, can we assume that they don't have any impact? I think it's still a little bit early to assume that, um, JMK, and here's why. Number one, even though cardiovascular disease is the, num is the number one, and depending on how you count it, number three causes of death, still, it's only one in three. So, in other, in other words, you have to be have, cause a very significant impact on cardiovascular death before it's going to show up in all-cause mortality. You bring up a good point when you say, or even cardiovascular mortality. Again, very good point. Um, good question. Good point. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Arabella. JMK with... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, that was JMK's question. Thank you so much, JMK, for bringing that up. Millard Woods. Good morning, Dr. Brewer. Good morning, uh, Millard or Millard. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. <clears throat> and good morning, Rick Folds in Atlanta. And E.T., he's back. 
just like uh, oh, the guy, Jack Nicholson. Bart Robinson, good morning, everyone. Great topic. Thank you so much, Bart. A reminder to give your thoughts again about enteric. Well, we covered that. Um, JMK, is it dangerous for cardio uh, coronary artery disease patients to take NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen for everyday activities and pains, aches and everyday aches and pains? No, it's not. You know, even if you're taking a baby aspirin, uh, usually um, it's fine to go ahead and, and take a, a non-steroidal. Those are both non-steroidals. You don't like to typically, you typically don't like to double up on drugs in the same class. Uh, but again, um, if you're talking about routinely taking Motrin or Naproxen day after day after day for arthritis, that's a different issue. That really needs to be discussed with your doc. Um, Rick Foles, Kraft Insulin Survey Pattern 5. Why does Pattern 5 say, when seen with normal glucose values, may indicate an extremely low-carb diet? How does low-carb diet affect insulin result? Well, if you don't eat carbs, you have a significant insulin reaction. Now, um, I, I think your question might be a little bit deeper than that because you're saying craft insulin survey. And here's the thing that I have. To me, Rick, that sounds like it's going back to that old uh, myth that if you don't eat carbs or if you don't carb load, you're going to get uh, unusual reactions on your OGTT or insulin survey. And again, I've covered that that urban myth multiple times in terms of the actual research that's out there. The evidence does not support that. So uh, if that's an error in the lab's officially printed interpretation, I hope you're not surprised. Just about every lab uh, report I've ever seen had errors in the interpretation. And the errors are not statistical errors. Basically, they're interpretation errors, like that one. Uh, another one being that um, your one-hour uh, optimum patterns are fine so long as it's no higher than 199. Ugh. Crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Mike, Mike Evans, can you take fish oil instead of baby aspirin? Of course you can. Does it have the same effect? It has a similar effect. Is it the same? No. Candace, good morning. What? In fact, I had a I had a patient recently, and I I, I get so many people. Like everything else, uh, we want to wish things to be true, and wishing something to be true is just not going to make it true. He said, uh, "I don't want to take baby aspirin," and we said, "Okay." He said, what else can we take? We gave him fish oil as well as a few other options from a supplemental perspective. And he said, well, OK, so you're telling me it'll do it. It works the same way and it has the same impact. And we said no. And he said, well, I want something that's going to work the same way and have the same impact. If there were something that works the same way and has the same impact, we would say that, you know, that would be well known. It's like there are multiple statins. Many of them work the same way and have the same impact. Many of them don't. And you hear those discussions. Um, same thing with supplements. Some work the same way, but not the same way as baby aspirin. Candace, good morning. What do you think about the people who say uh, IDL lowering should begin early in life? Oh, LDL lowering should begin in early in life, long-term exposure. So when you say long-term exposure, the question is long-term exposure to LDL, which implies that you think that LDL is the offending agent. There are several of us. Um, 
I'm leaning more and more in this direction as I continue to do this work, who think that LDL is probably not the arson, but the fire department. If that's the case, extended high LDL, yes, it's still a danger, but it's not a danger because of the extended high LDL. It's the, a danger because of the extended, what the extended high LDL is dealing with in terms of cardiovascular inflammation. I hope that was clear. E.T. himself, very likely. Not sure what that meant. Millard or Millard Woods, do most doctors check for atrial fib in their healthy patients? No, they don't. You know, a, paroxysmal atrial fib is very much like prediabetes. Docs just don't look for it. They don't know to look for it. Those that do know how to look for it, they get, you know, they feel like, well, it's too big of a deal. Not do it. And it's very common. Uh, okay, so since it is rather common, is it easy to find out if I have it? It's not that easy. You know, again, what you, um, I will tell you, I found mine not by going, uh, not by getting a Holter monitor or something similar. I got, I went to Amazon. And if you go to Amazon, you'll find things like, um, oh gosh, somebody remind me of the name. I did several videos on it to show it. Um, I Cardia, I K A R D I A. That's the one that I used. It was a, it was actually an iPhone cover that had two electrodes on the back, and you put your fingers on the electrodes, and it gave you a rhythm strip, a very clear rhythm strip. And when I had a couple of episodes, I woke up one morning. I'd had several episodes, not very common, but I'd had some episodes where uh, I had this fluttering in my chest. Well, <clears throat> it seemed to get a little bit worse, more frequent. And I remember waking up at two, two or three in the morning one time. It's back when we were living in an apartment in, uh, in Lexington after some moves uh, back from anyhow. That's a, that's a digression. I woke up. It felt like I had a fish, a big fish, flipping around in my chest. So I said, hmm, maybe that is atrial fib. And so I picked up my iPhone. I, I wet my fingers. I put them on the electrodes. And sure enough, looked like atrial fib. It was atrial fib. I, uh, at the time, I was working full time uh, in Tampa doing the weekend commute. And very, very deep into that, not watching my risk factors as well as I should have. I had gained a little bit of weight. Um, and we can, I continued to have problems with it. It got more and more frequent. In fact, I did go ahead and get a Holter monitor. And I got up to the point to where I had like 20% of my time in atrial fib. You don't want that to happen. Uh, your body starts, your heart starts wearing a rut in that, in that fibrillation type of, uh, of transmission or uh, a beat. Um, you don't want that. So, and that's just become clearer and clearer over the past few years. So when you discover atrial fib, you do want to get out of that. Now, I talked with a, an interventional cardiologist, an electrophysiologist who did a lot. I mean, that's, that was what he did for a living. Um, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm having another senior moment. He burned, he, they, basically what they do is they go in and burn areas that are very likely to have what we call aberrant conduction. So you burn that, that causes scarring. You get decreased transmission of the, uh, the electrical impulse through certain areas, high-risk areas of the atria. So we had that all set up. I finally agreed that I was going to get that done. But in the ensuing two months, I really got motivated and lost about eight more pounds. And when I did, it went away. I also did some things in terms of helping my um, 
breathing at night. So here, there are three things that are a really big deal in terms of atrial fib, body weight, and two other things that are very much associated with body weight. One is sleep apnea and the other is high blood pressure. All three of those things are very, very much related. I lost, again, like about eight pounds. My blood pressure decreased and my uh, sleep apnea decreased. And I declined uh, getting that procedure. Didn't get it. And I haven't had, I haven't had an, an episode in four years, a long, long time. So one of the things that that helped, an, another thing that that helps you recognize is that uh, people think, well, you know, um, aberrant conduction, uh, uh, dysrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias, the most common of which is uh, unrecognized atrial fib. All of these things are really not so much lifestyle diseases anymore. Yes, they are. And guess what? People think heart failure is not a lifestyle disease. Yes, it is. The most effective thing to do for atrial fib and for uh, heart failure is also the most effective thing for cardiovascular disease. So think about it and don't give up on those lifestyle components. Standing on the word, can you use a bit of aspirin to lower cholesterol? Aspirin does not affect cholesterol levels. Uh, Mabuhai, Bobby. Bobby lives in the Philippines and Mabuhai means something like good life, long life. Nathan Shapiro, I'm curious too about EPA, DHA instead of aspirin. Um, <clears throat> EPA is icosapentaenoic acid and DHA is, uh, gosh, having another senior moment. It's uh, basically these are the um, omega-3 or fish oils. And I hope uh, I gave you the information, Nathan, that you were looking for. Fort Worth West Side, how did they decide 81 milligrams was the right dosage? Is there a higher risk of stomach bleeding if taken daily? Well, I hope you saw the first part of the show where we talked about that. If you didn't, I will tell you, <laughs> they automatically made assumptions, which are usually good assumptions, that the smallest effective dose is always the best. Somebody recently actually went in and checked on that, compared uh, the 81 versus the 325, baby aspirin versus adult aspirin. And the reality was they did not see significant differences either in terms of positive impact or in terms of side effect. So I hope that's helpful. Fort Worth, JMK 2921, do you agree with Dr. Malcolm Kendrick that the initiating event for atherosclerosis is disruption of the glycocalyx and the coronary endothelium. Yes, I do. It's disruption of the glycocalyx and the coronary endothelium. Uh, I'm guessing you haven't heard a lot of our videos because we talk about that a lot. And here's the thing. In fact, I've got, I've got some pictures where I show what the glycocalyx is. The glycocalyx is a very thin single cell lining of the artery wall. It's sort of like um, when you, it, it's sort of like a marsh area. In, mar, in marsh areas, you have a major increase in the ability of biological growth. You get all of the small minnows growing, you get insects, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes a major um, uh, breadbasket and um, nursery for biological growth. You have something very similar with the marsh created by the glycocalyx. The, the glycocalyx itself may be single cell thin, but the internal surface is made up of fingerlings, glycocalyx. And the fingerlings, the hairy things sticking out, uh, are based on glucose. That's what glyco means. So guess what? Uh, if you have too high a glucose level for too long, you tend to 
destroy that glycocalyx. That is the first step in inflammation. It's also interesting to note that um, they've discovered and indicated multiple times that too high an insulin, even if the blood sugar is uh, normal, also causes this. Now, is that because insulin is impacting the glycocalyx itself? Or is that high insulin really more of an indicator that you have a lot of episodes of higher glucose values? I think we don't know the answer to that question. I suspect it might be the latter. Bobby Ocampo, any brand of fish oil you recommend? YouTube is saying 83% is oxidized. I agree. There's a there's a high level of oxidation on this. One of the questions I have is how valid is the assumption that oxidation, um, that the level of oxidation that you see in typical pills is really that bad? I mean, we know so little about this question as well as uh, the question, you know, the, the question that Amer and Phar Pharmaceuticals brought up when they created uh, uh, their medication, where they're saying, look, you really want completely, um, you want no DHA, you want EPA only. So there's a lot of questions still out there about EPA and the omega-3s. That is only one of them. Like I said, the ratio of EPA to DHA that's best is another one. Fort Worth West Side, if one is taking Eliquis, should they still take aspirin? Usually the answer is no. But there are some people who have what we call DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy. This is not exactly dual antiplatelet therapy because Eliquis thins the blood through another mechanism. Uh, DAC, uh, DAC, dual anticoagulant therapy. And quite often you see that with people that have had procedures like stents or coronary artery bypass graft. Melissa, do you think Cosentix, which is a biologic for arthritis, is safe regarding mitochondrial function? It has been recognized. I take it for my osteoarthritis. I'm worried about more about mitochondrial damage. I don't know if uh, the answer to your question, Melissa. One thing I do know is that you know we talk about constantly about insulin resistance and diabetes being a major risk factor for heart disease. One thing we don't talk about is that rheumatoid arthritis is as much of a risk factor for heart disease as diabetes. And here's the kicker. Since most people have developed insulin resistance or prediabetes by the time they're 55 or 60, the ones that have arthritis probably have that as well. So you've got a major double whammy going on. Um, in my cardiovascular patients that have these diseases, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, I follow them with the, um, with the rheumatologists. And, you know, again, the, um, the medicines that, that are used for these inflammatory diseases are not harmless medicines. They are tough on the body. But the question is, uh, are they not safer than two of the things that are most, uh, most tough on the body, two of the things, uh, the inflammation associated with rheumatoid or arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or some of the others, in combination with the most common thing that's really rough on the body that kills more people than anything else. And that is insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes. So it's not a, you know, it's not one of those things where um, we can just say, oh, well, Cosentix is dangerous. I'm, you know, we all know Cosentix has its problems, but the real problem is, is 
the thing that I find more often than anything else is an underestimate of the risk associated with the combination of diabetes and rheumatoid disease. E.T. himself, Bobby Ocampo, the high quality ones or not. Prevention is better than cure, standing on the word. Absolutely. Bobby, uh, how can we suggest research topics? Exa example, high dose vitamin K2 with chronic disease. Your subscribers can help email. Um, yes, if you go into, um, uh, Gilbert, if you will, if you will, post our email address. I would appreciate it. Um, it's myhealth at prevmedheartrisk.com. Myhealth at prevmedheartrisk.com. You can email there and our folks will get these requests. Any brand you can recommend. It. <clears throat> I think there's a side discussion about K2. Doctor's Best uh, Jero, um, Life Extension. These are all very good. Yep. So there you go. You have both our telephone number and our uh, website. And on our website, you can also find the email, my health at prevmed uh, heartrisk.com. And um, uh, Gilbert, if you'll make a little banner that you can put up uh, to show people that in the future, I would appreciate it. Oh, Harvey Ops, thank you so much. I always forget to ask people to click the like button. Even if you don't want to make a contribution, just clicking the like button helps this information get out there because it makes the AI, the um, artificial intelligence machine that run, runs how, many, how much exposure your content gets, it makes that um, realize that this is important to humans. An even more important way of doing this is posting this on things like Facebook, um, getting the actual link and going to other places like Facebook and Twitter. When the AI recognizes that somebody came in to look at our content from another, uh, another social media, in other words, our content helped steal a couple, a couple of eyeballs from Facebook or Twitter. That makes a really, really big deal. So thanks for thinking about that. ET himself, I'm in Canada and using a Canadian brand not likely to be in the U.S. Bobby Ocampo, can osteocalcin be measured? It's a good indicator for K2. Yes, Bobby, you're bringing up a good point. And uh, we've got a whole series of videos on osteocalcin. Um, it is a, uh, a stimulator for osteoblasts and osteoclasts, um, depending on what's going on. And um, that in itself is then in turn related to uh, insulin resistance. So I think that's really the impact for uh, K2, I don't, you know, the the urban myth, the internet, the web myth is that K2 takes calcium out of the arteries and puts it back in the blood, I mean, back in the, uh, in the bones. And I don't think it's exactly that way. I think there's more of a mechanism and I think it has to do with osteocalcin. So thanks for bringing it up. I've got, again, I've got a whole series of uh, videos uh, discussing that. Do I recommend it? Uh, with some reservations, I mean, the bottom line is that K2 is not that well, the, the evidence behind a K2 is not that uh, overwhelming, like vitamin D3, for example, or uh, niacin for those that need it. Uh, but it's pretty substantial. And there's a lot of research going on right now for that. I suspect we'll find more positive information on K2 as that research is completed. E.T. Bobby Ocampo, only buy at a quality health food store. Uh, oh, gosh. We, huh. Now we've got a problem. The, we've got, we're getting a lot of questions here and a lot of comments, so much so that the, the question list is starting to jump around. Bart, Bart buys from Swanson. 
Bambi Grage, good to hear from you, Bambi. Long time no, well, start to say long time no hear from, but um, we've been hearing from you more. Bambi was listening to Kara Fitzgerald pod, podcast with Dr. Roizen about the new book, Great Age Reboot. He was saying that if in hormone, if on hormones, you should take baby aspirin because of increased risk of clots. Interesting. Question, one of the questions is which hormones? Uh, I'm learning the more bunny holes, okay. Melissa, the more I'm learning, the more bunny holes I go down. <laughs> so many bunny holes. Isn't that the truth, Melissa? JMK, let's hear it for Dr. Brewer and his bunny holes. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Jack Tannehill, Tannehill promoter. Jack Tannehill promoter. I would take IP6 before I take aspirin. IP6. Not familiar with that. Uh, Bobby Ocampo hopes CIMT will be a part of measurement and research on prolonged fasting. Uh, that's a whole nother set of um, uh, bunny holes. Aura Ruth, good to hear from you. Aura Ruth says, Mabahe Doc, Mabahai, or in case, also Shalom. So as you may have guessed, Aura Ruth is from the Middle East, Israel. Leo Acapulco, good morning, Dr. Brewer. What do you recommend if you cannot take aspirin in case of GERD? Uh, I do rec recommend that you look at some of the uh, supplement types of um, things, most commonly the omega-3s. Good question, Leo. Per Johnson, I eat 10 hours from 8 to 18. So 10, uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., I guess for 14, fast for 14 hours. Is that enough to start uh, apoptosis or plaque removal or more, you know, you're gonna get, it depends on how much you eat. There's also a significant component of, you know, if you eat um, 200 calories worth of salad in the morning and 200 calories worth of salad in the night, you're gonna get a lot of, um, um, autophagy, which is what's more reliable. Uh, autophagy is one of the first steps in, um, in going down this path of, um, of better health. So, <clears throat> you know, it's one of those things people keep talking about, well, there's no place for caloric restriction. It's all fasting, like intermittent fasting. And, you know, I covered that article January 26, I think it's 2018. Um, it was a New England Journal article, great um, editorial article about, and, and it had more than just editorial. It was, it had a lot about the science of, of um, intermittent fasting. And it made the point that a lot of the things that we thought were, um, caloric restriction back in the old days, in the 80s, programs were actually intermittent fasting because you'd feed the lab animals. They were getting, they were restricted in terms of food. So really what was happening was they were getting fed once a day and then they were doing intermittent fasting the rest of the day. Well, part of the prop, uh, issue there though was again, there was decreased uh, daily calories. And so, again, if you, <clears throat> let's go back to Per Johnson's question. Let's say you get um, 3,000 calories in the morning and 3,000 calories at night. How much is that going to stimulate autophagy compared to 200 calories in the morning and 200 calories at night? Or, you know, and there's more realistic, I'm obviously stretching the, the analogy here, but, um, and there's obviously most of us are going at numbers in between, but still, I hope you get the point that um, 
sometimes I think we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think there is a, a discussion and a real place to discover, okay, just how many calories are you eating on a regular basis? Bobby Ocampo. And let me just get back to one point that's maybe a little bit more uh, to your question. If you go back and you look at the time-restricted uh, eating uh, evidence, clearly the more the the more narrow the time restriction, um, the better. Now, um, if you if you're well fed and you're talking about a 14 hour fast, are you really stimulating a whole lot? No, not that much. So I hope that helped. Bobby Ocampo, what test do we need to determine clotting factors? Well, I mean, there's lots of tests for um, clotting time. My last test with carotid duplex scan shows I have type three echogenic plaque, the echogen, the echolucent, no echolucent plaque. Do you recommend an aspirin? So it depends on what you mean by echogenic and echolucent. Um, uh, echogenic, uh, well, <clears throat> bottom line is echogenic plaque usually means plaque that has calcium in it. If the only plaque that you have has calcium, um, that's important that plaque appears to be stable. Echolucent means that the, um, the ultrasound vibration waves go straight through it. In other words, there's no calcium in it. That is um, what we call soft plaque or um, soft plaque is, is at risk for squeezing back through that endothelium, the intima, and touching the blood and causing a, pl a clot. Now, back to your specific question, though, the bottom line is if you have plaque 1.3 millimeters of greater, all of us in my space would still recommend that you take baby aspirin because what that means is you have formed risk-conferring plaque. You've got plaque. And it's not a question of you take baby aspirin if you have soft plaque. It's a question of if you have plaque, because the issue is you didn't feel it when you had that, when that plaque first formed. And when it first formed, it was soft. So you don't do, um, the recommendation is not baby aspirin and low dose statins for soft plaque only. The recommendation is if you've got plaque, even though it's stable, you've gone through episodes of inflammation and you're at much greater risk to go through those again. Uh, the baby aspirin and the low dose statins are safeguards to help prevent the formation of that clot. ETMs, whether it's, whether it's a, so, a soft plaque or a stable, currently stable plaque. E.T. himself. In Canada, about 200 people die from aspirin and kind of interesting, about 200 people die from Tylenol. Yep. Per year. Uh, will it be better to take K1 than aspirin or both is better? No. Uh, you're confusing um, the, the vitamin K antagonists. K1 does have to do with clotting. K2 does not. K1 helps you clot. Things like warfarin um, are what we call a vitamin K1 antagonist. They decrease the function of K1 and thin the blood that way. So we've got a little bit, again, a couple of uh, reverse perceptions there, Bobby. I hope, hope that was helpful. Hope that was understandable. Uh, <clears throat> Orange me again. Huge thank you for addressing him. Uh, my topic. You're very, very welcome, Bart, and thank you for bringing it up. Fort Worth West Side doesn't Bauer still, oh, Bear, still make chewable aspirin. Yeah, well, that's what we recommended. Um, I'm assuming Bear does. Um, 
you can find, although most of the baby aspirin you find is enteric coated, you do find significant uh, number options with uh, chewable baby aspirin that isn't enteric coated. JMK, is it okay to just swallow the chewable? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it sounds like something I would do. ET, yes, vape king. Let me see how, oh my gosh. Oh, folks, we have time. No one, I am not going to get to all these questions. Let me let me see if I can zip through some of them. Uh, you say the chewable are the best. Yes. I get the chewable baby aspirin at the dollar store. Good. Uh, PubMed, find the article, antiplatelet active activity of inositol. Uh, let me see. The drunken chefs. Give the half -life, given the half-life of aspirin instead of baby aspirin, would it, would it be okay to take a standard 325 every four days or so? Actually, you make a really good case for that. Um, what happens is once aspirin uh, is in the body, it impacts the platelets that are there. And it takes a while for those platelets. Once, once you decrease, uh, stop taking the aspirin, it takes a while for the uh, anti-clotting effect to go away. The WHO were just giving a talk on Twitter about their vaccines. I said, if they are concerned for our health, why don't they stop poisoning? I'm not sure. Sounds like that was uh, going into some politics. Kung Hei Fat Choi. I'm not sure what that means. Someone told me, well, trying to lower my cholesterol, but I don't want statins. Can you suggest anything preferably? Um, we have, we have done a video on that. Oh gosh, years ago. I don't really focus on that that much because, um, I focus less and less on LDL and more and more on insulin resistance, diabetes and prediabetes. The aspirin, can, aspirin can be bad for GERD. Um, at PubMed, you can find an article titled Natural Products with Antiplatelet Action. And on my video, you can find natural products, um, um, su supplements that have antiplatelet or supplement blood thinners. You can check it out either way. So <clears throat> uh, let me see. Let's see if we can get a couple more questions done. Nadir Ali video is saying that body naturally increases LDL and lower LDL has higher all-cause mortality. I know that he does. There's a, you know, he's in the debate on the other side of that issue. I tend to lean more, a little bit more towards Nadir's side. However, I, I think he makes too much of the whole LDL issue too. Ablation. Thank you so much. I was uh, having a senior moment trying to remember the term. Ablation is what they do uh, when they burn the um, uh, the atrial, the atria, uh, to try to to stop uh, atrial fibrillation. So I am again. Uh, gosh, I've got maybe two more minutes. This ne video needs to get more likes. Thank you so much. I agree with that. Please. Think about it. It's easy and it's cheap. And it tells the AI to get that information out there. Broken forever. Stan standing, why are you worried about uh, cholesterol? Yeah, standing on the word. Uh, broke. It's been mentioned here that it doesn't matter. Uh, top load telly. Top load telly. My cardio doc recently took me off the 81 milligrams of aspirin after 12 years left me only 10 milligrams of Prasugrel and a 40 milligrams of Torvastatin. He is, is it unusual to come off of aspirin? Not when you're on Prasugrel or one of the other blood thinners. That's what we're talking about. You're on uh, dual anticoagulants. 
What are the long-term effects of amitriptyline do you know of? Uh, don't spend much time prescribing amitriptyline, so I'm not going to be much help there. Can you comment on risk associated with K2 supplementation when taking Prasagrel? No, uh, you're really not going to see risk. K2 does not impact blood coagulation. That's K1. Halifax House, Q1, not sure. The video cut for GERG question, did you say cut out omega-3s? Now, I'm not familiar with significant impact on GERD with omega-3s. Clearly, with aspirin and the other non-steroidals, you can get that. And here's Aura Ruth. Dr. Walter Longo does not recommend that people fast 15 to 16 hours daily on a long-term basis. He also recommends several things. If you look at his, um, his diet, again, that's a, it's been a few years since I... Uh, used his diet and wrote prescriptions for it. Uh, one, of, one of the problems with his fasting mimicking diet is that um, it's full of carbs. You know, the soups, especially tomato soup, some of the other, uh, I think there was a mushroom soup. And the problems um, were when you take, for me, I, I documented it and did a video on it and, and showed people when I took Walter Longo's soups in the fasting mimicking diet, it jacked up my blood sugar to like 180 and higher. So I'd go out and take a walk. Um, that's one of the things that he does, even though he understands that diabetes is a major cause of aging and the, the diseases associated with aging, he's still very plant-based. And uh, yes, you can go low carb with plant based, but it's like I'm quizzical that Walter Longo tends to ignore uh, the dangers associated with uh, carbs. He doesn't completely ignore it. He deals with the issue. But I, that's I'm a big Walter Longo fan, but uh, I don't think I don't agree with him completely on um some of his comments about fasting, not so much that one. Um, well, I, I will say if somebody needs to lose weight, a 15 to 16 hour fast is, uh, is very helpful. Um, now, then we start getting into arguments about long term. Again, you mentioned Walter Longo, and I started talking about him, and I will say again, I think he has some interesting perspectives on eating carbs. Uh, Shannon, oh, gosh, I, folks, I am going to have to go. It's, I really appreciate the interest and the participation. And if you didn't get your question answered, come back next week. Uh, hopefully, we'll, you'll, get it an, you'll get it there in time for me to answer it. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.